Welcome to Inbox Roundup number 10. Today we're going to talk about why no flamethrowers are being used in Ukraine, uh, a Russia versus U.S. Desert Storm Force, uh, ballistic shields for clearing trenches, the M1 Grand ping sound, whether that sound is dangerous, and uh, what happens to destroyed equipment, and finally, is mobile the future of artillery. I have a couple of guest stars today, so this should be a lot of fun. A couple of things before I get started. I'm headed down to Dallas, Texas today for a fundraiser for Ultra, the Ukraine Logistics and Tactical Resupply Association. There's a few tickets left. The event is on May 20th, Saturday, tomorrow, so don't miss it. If you want to meet me, the Eventbrite link is in the description and pinned comments below. All the proceeds go to body armor and first aid kits for American volunteers fighting in Ukraine. And as always, if you want to support the channel, I'm doing Cameo. So if you want an awesome Father's Day gift, I'll send you a personalized message. And as always, you can get a t-shirt from Bunker Branding or toss me five bucks on Substack if you want to support the channel. Let's get started. Uh, Gizmo Brat asks, Ryan, is there a reason we don't see flamethrowers being used to clear bunkers like the U.S. did on World War II, in World War II with the Japanese? I have seen videos where multiple grenades have not cleared a bunker in Ukraine. Um, so the flamethrower is a lot like the panda. It's an evolutionary dead end. You know how the panda only eats bamboo and doesn't reproduce very fast? Well, flamethrowers are kind of the military equivalent of the panda. They're, they're really heavy. They're like 70 pounds. Uh, flamethrowers have a short range, like 20 to 40 meters. Um, they have a short fire duration, like five to seven bursts. So I think it worked on World War II because that was really the only tool in their toolkit. I think that today we can suppress bunkers using 40 millimeter grenades. I don't really foresee, I hate to sound like a project manager, the juice being worth the squeeze when it comes to using a flamethrower, uh, especially since it's so heavy, you have to get across that uh, open area to get to the trench. Uh, and then if you fall, you're in a lot of freaking trouble. Now, flying to Texas on short notice isn't cheap, nor is donating money and time to Ultra, so give me 60 seconds to pay the bills here. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Click the link in the description below and get Atlas VPN for only $1.83 a month with three months extra and a 30-day money-back guarantee. I am traveling to Texas today, and when I travel for both this channel and my civilian job, I use Atlas VPN to keep me safe when connecting to unknown Wi-Fi. In fact, I even use it on the plane when I get the in-flight Wi-Fi because I have no idea what satellite constellation that plane is routing through. And when I book my flights, I use Atlas VPN to change my location because location-based price discrimination is a thing. You can try it yourself. Look up a flight from your location, then change your location and look at the price again. It's probably going to be different. Atlas VPN acts as a tunnel between you and the public internet that hackers and rogue government agents can't penetrate. So click the link in the description below and get Atlas VPN for only $1.83 a month with three months extra and a 30-day money-back guarantee. Okay, Chuck asks, what if the U.S. military today provided comparable sized units to fight Desert Storm on the Russian forces that are currently fighting in Ukraine? How fast could they remove into Ukraine and destroy all the Russian forces currently in Ukraine. So I'm not sure that we could fight the Gulf War again the way we did it. Uh, we no longer have the second armored division. We no longer have the third armored division. Uh, that being said, I, it's, it's kind of a weird question because the, the effort in the Gulf War was done with a coalition. It wasn't just an American show. The British were there, the French were there, the Egyptians were there. The Syrians were there, we had Kuwaitis, we had Saudis. So we had this whole coalition of forces that could be used where it would be appropriate to use these forces. Um, the other thing is that it's kind of a weird question because we only have three armored brigades in Europe right now. And right now, I, I believe Ukraine has about 50-ish maneuver brigades. So adding three armor brigades to those current three Ukrainian maneuver brigades really wouldn't be that effective, right? You're only adding three more brigades, even though they might be very good brigades with very good equipment and highly motivated soldiers, it's still only three brigades. So we would need an entire buildup of forces. We'd need to form a coalition. We'd need to um, 
uh, create, would need to activate the National Guard and Reserves. So I think just from baseline, it would take at least six months to activate the Guard, activate the Reserves, get more equipment over there to do kind of like a Gulf War style push into Russia. So it's kind of a it's kind of a tough question to answer because our military today is a fraction of the size the military was uh, during the first Gulf War. And, you know, the other thing is that as much as I'd love to say, oh, we could go in there and we could defeat them in three weeks. Well, you know, Russia thought they could take Kiev in three days. War is hard and a lot of stuff comes up in war that you didn't anticipate. And if the U.S. were if NATO decided to launch a Gulf War style attack into Russia, that may not go as we planned. The other thing is that a lot of times we, we tend to think of things in a vacuum. Oh, what if we just poof, magically put these units here? Well, there, and there is no magically put these units here. We have to get these units across the ocean and, and Russia might have something to say about that in, in the form of anti-ship missiles and submarines destroying these cargo ships. So uh, I would say it would take at least six months to get the right amount of forces on the ground. And after that, ask Mark Milley. I, I am not good enough to answer this question, as you'll see later on in the video when I ask our special guests some questions. Uh, so Peter asks, why don't the Ukrainian forces use ballistic shields, especially when attacking clearing trenches? So I think a, a level four ballistic shield, which can stop high powered uh, rifle rounds, armor piercing rounds, that's like that's like 72 pounds. It's so heavy it has to fit on a dolly, you know? So you're not bringing that into a trench. The level three the shields are like 27 pounds. And that might be fine for a cop who's going in after a barricaded suspect. If you're clearing a trench line, you're constantly moving and you can't use your rifle. So now you've got a pistol, you know, peeking over that ballistic shield shooting your pistol. It's not very effective against soldiers who are shooting at you with rifles. It's probably pretty effective against a barricaded suspect in a bank with a pistol or a shotgun. Not so effective against dudes with machine guns shooting at you. Um, so now you're not very mobile. You can't fire your rifle. I don't know how well that level three shield is going to work against machine guns with armor piercing ammunition. And, you know, this isn't Call of Duty. It's not like press the left trigger to hold up the shield and press the right trigger to fire. Like, it's hard to hold a shield up. 27 pounds. Take um, take a gallon of milk or, or whatever you might use in your country, an, an equivalent of, of uh, a jug of milk, and hold that like this, and, and now do it for do it for a minute, and do it for five minutes. Now now imagine doing it for like an hour. Like it's just not it, it's not an effective way to clear a trench, and you're essentially losing one dude for just a little bit of protection. Uh, so SF-180 asks, after 40 years of service and multiple combat deployments, I am left to believe that the M1's distinctive ping couldn't have been that big of a deal, even with hearing protection, firefights, or noisy, confusing engagements. I can't imagine anyone outside of a 10-foot radius of the shooter would hear the M1 ping. I was wondering if our adversaries ever made a comment on the ping. Somehow I doubt it. So the M1 was a standard American battle rifle in World War II and in, um, in uh, the Korean War. And when it was out of ammunition, the clip would actually eject with this audible ping. And you saw this in movies, uh, Saving Private Ryan or Call of Duty, you hear this M1 ping. It's an interesting question, um, but I don't know that much about guns. So here's Curtis Hallstrom from the VSO Gun Channel to give you an answer. Hey Ryan, thanks for having me on. The short answer to the question is probably not, but it also depends on what the circumstances is that we're talking about. So if we're talking about the Germans, I'm going to say no. But if we're talking about the Japanese, well, maybe. But I mean, we are talking about a fighting force that at the time considered it a viable strategy to take one of their most technically advanced pieces of equipment, load it full of extra fuel and explosives, and take their second most valuable irreplaceable commodity, train pilots, load them in it, and have them crash it into things. Kamikaze run, Sui Sui run into an American platoon, uh, Six of one, half dozen of the other. I mean, not to get all geopolitical on you or anything, but uh, we are talking about an ideology that was fanatical enough that we considered after running the numbers that it would be a, a more advantageous position as far as uh, loss of human life is concerned to nuke two of their cities rather than it conventionally invade the Japanese homeland. And 
we definitely had a third weapon ready to go and at least enough fissile material laying around to do bombs four and five. So in for a penny, in for a pound, if you will. But outside of the psychological aspects of whether this is a potential practice, I think there's some practical applications that we have to look at as well. The standard American platoon of the day was composed of a 12-man squad and roughly eight to 10 of those men would carry the M1 Garand. The rest of the composition was split between Thompson submachine guns, which usually delegated to the squad leader, assistant squad leader, something like that, but you almost always had a BAR man, which was the light machine gun of the, of the American military at the time. And by light machine gun, it was the squad automatic weapon. And it was a single man portable weapon fired off a 20 round box magazine. It was highly portable compared to a lot of the other machine guns being used even within our own military, but then of course the adversarial militaries as well. And then the rest of the composition was some kind of support troop like a DMR, a rifle grenade, and sometimes flamethrowers and things like that. You get the you get the gist. If we compare that, for instance, to the German military, they operated off of a assistant squad leader, squad leader, both carrying usually MP40 submachine guns. And then you had a single MG42, which was their machine gun, had a very high cyclic rate, was a very heavy gun, required two-man operation. So it was a crew-served weapon. Uh, they would have the machine gun between them, probably some uh, a Luger, uh, but maybe rifles as well, depending on what their setup was. And then the rest of the composition was five riflemen. Those riflemen were armed with a K98. We'll come back to that here in a second. If you look at the Japanese composition, it was a 13-man squad. Everybody carried the Type 99 Arasaka rifle, except for the lone machine gunner, which carried the Type 99 machine gun. Let's look at those battle rifles for, for a second. The M1 Garand was an eight-shot semi-automatic rifle. If you look at both the K98 and the Arasaka rifle, both of those are five-shot capacity bolt-action rifles. So they lose in capacity and they lose in fire rate. So you've got an eight round semi-automatic rifle going up against a five round bolt action rifle in both situations. Both of those adversarial rifles were fed by either single round or stripper clip. The other thing I would say about that is the amount of time that it takes to reload a Garand is somewhere around a second and a half for a trained soldier. I am not a trained soldier, but here's a shot of me reloading one. So if we take a look at the capability breakdown of those three groups, and we'll just go ahead and discount the situation over on the Japanese side, which was woefully undersupplied, as well as uh, the, both the primary weapons were documented jam o -matics. I mean, uh, well-documented, unreliable, and accurate weaponry uh, by any stretch or any metric that you compare them to, except for maybe perhaps the American Reisig submachine gun, but... I mean, we literally had Marines throwing them over the side of the boat when they left Guadalcanal so they wouldn't be issued to anybody else. But that, besides that one, just about everything else that we were talking about was a fairly reliable weapon system. If you look at stacking up eight-round semi-automatic rifles against five-round bolt-action rifles, there's a huge disparity of force there. And, I mean, why the heck do you think the American government wants to take your semi-automatic rifles away? That's even considering the supplemental capabilities of something like the MG42 because, remember, it was a little less mobile than the squad automatic weapon concept that the Americans were putting down. And oftentimes this discussion about the M1 ping comes up uh, in this fictitious scenario of a 1v1, a German or Japanese soldier versus an American soldier. Bang, 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 cling. And then the dude closes the distance and does the battle, right? Uh, Supposing that you could hear that in any other situation than what we just described, you're going to have 8 to 11 other dudes pointing aught sixes at that dude's face. And there's a few things that we have to talk about as far as being able to hear it. That projectile is doing 26, 2700 feet per second, so it's doing roughly Mach 2. That bullet is going to scream past you faster then the speed of sound, so you're going to hear the report of the bullet as it passes you. And we'll go to the range and I'll go ahead and show that to you. So as that bullet goes by, the first thing you hear is the supersonic crack of that bullet. It's literally sonic booming, which the uh, camera doesn't do it justice. It's much louder than is uh, given to you on the camera, because remember the camera takes the high sound and the low sound and then compresses them down into a 
hearable range. Otherwise, you'd have to be wearing hearing protection to watch this video, right? That would be completely impractical. Along those same lines, after that supersonic crack goes by and deafens you, <laughs> you also have the report of the rifle and the cling that happens at the same time. The only thing about that is those two sounds kind of meld together because you have a rifle report of a 30 odd six is somewhere around the 175 decibel range and maybe the cling is 80, maybe. I've not measured it, I don't know. Those two sounds are basically going to become one. So unless you visually see the end block loader eject out of the rifle, then you're not gonna be able to discern that and to prove that to you, here's a look at 50 yards. I'm using modern recording equipment that is far more capable than the human ear will ever be, <laughs> and I can't get it. So to recap, so we check all the boxes on this question to make sure that we've answered it thoroughly, you gotta have the fanaticism to charge a position that's got eight to 12 dudes with OT6 pointed at your face. All those OT6s gotta run out of ammunition at the exact same time, and you gotta be fast enough and be close enough to get there by the time they reload. So you got three seconds. Using modern self-defense doctrine, you can cover roughly 21 feet, so seven yards in one second. If we're conservative about it, we'll say that you gotta be within 30 yards of the position to be able to get it, and you gotta be able to hear it. Remember also that you are not wearing hearing protection at the time. You are firing, if you're on the Japanese side, then you're firing an arrow, or, uh, in Arasaka, if you're on the German side, then you're firing an eight millimeter Mauser. You are f***ing deaf. I'm gonna say that this never happened. Thank you so much, Curtis. If you wanna visit his channel, it's in the pinned comments below. Andy from Toronto asks, when an important piece of equipment like a tank or a critical artillery piece, for example, is destroyed beyond repair, what is the process of disposal and replenishment? Is everything replaceable from some warehouse? How do troops deal with out of stock issues? So there, there's two cases. Two cases here. In peacetime, uh, if there's like a rollover or a vehicle accident, there's gonna be an investigation. Uh, there's be a commander's investigation, 15-6 investigation on how the accident happened. And then the MPs, uh, military police or CID, criminal investigative division will, will get involved uh, to see if, if there was, um, uh, if anybody needs to be charged for damaging this equipment. And they're also going to take lessons learned so that they can improve safety so that thing doesn't happen again. Uh, the other thing that might happen is contractors might come out to inspect the equipment to see if it's an equipment fault. Let's say a howitzer blows up while guys are shooting the howitzer. Well, there's going to be an investigation. And then they might actually uh, invite contractors out from the manufacturer to come take a look at the howitzer to see if there was some kind of manufacturing defect in the howitzer. Um, if the equipment can't be repaired by the unit, it'll normally be sent back to depot for reset where it'll it'll be refurbished. In some cases, like if a Humvee wrecks and it's like beyond repair, we, we have plenty of Humvees. So it'll be drained of fluids and it'll be used as like a range target or it'll be used as like a training vehicle to help recover other vehicles because soldiers need practice in recovering rolled over vehicles or vehicles that are at the bottom of a, of a ravine. Um, in the near term, you'll probably get a vehicle from a different understrength company or maybe one from stocks, but that's going to take months to get. So odds are there'll be some other company in your battalion that is short personnel. They have an extra vehicle. You might get assigned that vehicle on a temporary basis until the vehicle can come from depot to replace the one that was broken. Uh, in wartime, your vehicle is going to get towed back to a holding area, most likely. Uh, if the tactical situation permits, it's going to be stripped of parts on an as-needed basis. So that, that Humvee or whatever vehicle will be stripped of parts like, hey, we need an extra tire. You know, let's take it off the, let's take it off the parts Humvee. Uh, during wartime, you're probably not going to get another vehicle uh, unless war stocks allow it or another unit that's taking casualties is kind of rolled into your own unit. Um, is everything replaceable from the warehouse? Kind of, and in some cases, yes. There's stocks at Sierra Army Depot, but it could take months to get to you. So you're probably not gonna get this thing while you're in combat. Uh, one funny note to this, the mechanics in my support company uh, brought a Humvee back. When I was in Iraq, they, they, found a, they found a Humvee that had been destroyed. Uh, they, they took it 
And they basically brought it back to life and they painted it black and they use it as a truck to go to North End Pizza. <laughs> so, which is this pizza place at the North End of Camp Liberty. Um, so how do troops deal with out of stock issues? Uh, honestly, you go without. Your, if your vehicle is deadlined, meaning the commander says it, it can't be moved, you might take parts from another damaged vehicle or another deadline vehicle to get the other vehicle running. And usually uh, the NCO support system is pretty good at sweet talking vehicles out of another company. So if you absolutely need a vehicle for a mission and you, 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 know, you have a good NCO support system, one of those sergeants has another sergeant in another company, he might sweet talk an NCO from another company to let the executive officer and the commander from that other company let that vehicle go to you on a temporary basis. So the NCOs usually figure it out. Next up, Kelsey asks, do you think mobile self-propelled howitzers such as the Archer or Caesar are the future of artillery? If not, what niche do, could self-propelled howitzers fill in comparison to armored systems such as the PZH-2000 or the M1299? Uh, I could probably give you an answer, but I would probably screw it up. So here's Madamus, who knows more about artillery than I will ever know. Hey, Ryan, thank you so much for having me on your video today. And it's a honor and a privilege to be able to present artillery and, of course, specifically self-propelled artillery to your viewers. Being an artillery gunner myself, this question really speaks to me because self-propelled artillery is fascinating. The way in which it's being developed, the technology that's being pushed into modernized artillery today is really, really cool. But the question specifically focuses on the niche of both Archer and Caesar. And I would have to say that when it comes to wheeled artillery compared to tracked artillery, there's certainly some advantages and disadvantages of the two that are starting to be seeing a lot more prominent in places like Ukraine. Let's talk about wheeled artillery first of all, because Caesar and Archer, of course, being wheeled, do have some advantages in terms of mobility, but also some disadvantages. Pretty obvious, the advantages. They can move very quickly on roads and can be strategically deployed across the battlefield fast. What that means is if there is a road to get to a battlefield or a battle group, they can use that and transition there very, very quickly, unlike tracked vehicles that need to be put on rail flats or trains to transport them to the front. That is a big deal because not only are you getting vehicles there quickly, their ammunition and the supplies that go with it can follow on suit. The challenge that we're starting to see specifically with wheeled self-propelled artillery, because it is inherently very big with a 155mm gun on the back of there, is they are struggling in the mud. In Ukraine, we're seeing the spring melt or the flush of snow as well is causing a lot of problems for big heavy-duty vehicles that are not tracked and don't have that off-road capability of that of some of the other vehicles like the K9 Thunder, the Paladin, and the Crab. The other thing we need to consider when we're talking about artillery in general is the protection of those firing the gun. Now, most tracked fighting vehicles in self-propelled configuration have a fighting compartment that is sealed from projectiles that come in, things like proximity ammunition or airburst. That can devastate dismounts that are loading the gun, similar to that of Caesar. But the Caesar does have an advantage. It can very, very quickly pull out of the area. But as I said, if counter battery is coming and you're already being located with things like drones, because drones is the forefront now of forward observation, being a forward observer myself, my job is slowly being made redundant. But, uh, you know, the Caesar and Archer being wheeled can pull out quickly, whereas not as fast with some of the track configurations. But the protection is there from that airburst ammunition, whereas you have something like Archer where the dismounts are out the back, loading the gun to the rear. It's causing problems. Archer itself has its own self-loading system, so that's fantastic. But we have to consider the protection of the artillery crew as well, because infantry are always looking for artillery as well. Artillery is an asset on the battlefield, king of battle. Um, and we have to consider that, you know, having that extra protection in track fighting vehicles is very, very important. So mobility is key. We do not want artillery to be taken out. And the tracked vehicles are doing better. It's seen first and foremost in Ukraine in the muddier terrain, but they struggle in getting to the front sometimes or transitioning to other battlefields because they cannot get there as quick as some of the wheeled vehicles. So is there a niche for that? Definitely. It's very specific to which artillery unit requires that form of firepower. If they need it to be quick to the front and pull off again, so be it. If they need it to be able to transition across any terrain in any type of weather, might be best to go for the tracked vehicles. Another thing to consider is ammunition. And it's fascinating how many people believe that ammunition is interchangeable across all NATO artillery platforms, especially in the 155 millimeter configuration. Remember, the projectile is interchangeable in NATO. The propellant, not so much. And that's where people get confused. 
The propellant that is pushing the projectile out of the barrel is manufactured by many different companies, different brands, different sizes, and different styles. This is where things start to get complicated when we're trying to talk about having vehicles that strategically are linked in logistics for ammunition. And artillery is a pig. It absorbs a lot of logistic supply and ammunition to do what it does best. To destroy targets, to define destruction of a target, requires thousands upon thousands of rounds. Suppression is a little bit different, keeping the enemy's head down, taking casualties. But you can't just change ammunition like we think you can across NATO. The projectile? Pretty standard. But because of those different propellants and the different manufacturers of guns and the pressures in those guns can vary significantly. So just take that away as some food for thought when you're looking at the logistics side. Not super sexy and exciting, but the artillery, we take that very seriously because there's nothing we can do if we don't have ammunition. And if we have another NATO force working alongside us that have a thousand 155 mm projectiles and no propellant that works on our gun, we're in trouble. So something to consider. So thanks again, Ryan, for bringing me into uh, your video today. And to finally really summarize that question in terms of a niche, I truly do feel that wheeled artillery is here to stay. And we are now looking at mobile artillery firing on the move. Yes, self-propelled artillery that's able to fire the gun as it drives to the next location. Really cool stuff. I can't wait to see what is going to come through with that. That is very new in its sort of precision guidance firing. There is still a lot of development going on with that. I can't imagine the amount of computing and the amount of precision engineering that goes into making something that can fire such large projectiles on the move and have them land on point. Thanks again, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my little blurb about artillery and self propelled artillery, and I hope I answered the question as best as I could. All the best. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Madamus. If you want to view his channel, I'll have that in the pinned comments below. And that's it. Like I said before, if you want to support the channel, buy a cameo greeting for Dad, get a t-shirt on Bunker Branding, or toss me five bucks on my sub stack. Oh, hi, America. It's me, Elon. Uh, if you want to be cool like me, go and get a Ryan McBeth t-shirt or hoodie from Bunker Branding. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get a high mile shirt because it fires rockets, and rockets are pretty cool, just like me. Ha 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 ha, you fool. It is me, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook, and I will be the coolest once I get a Patriot shirt because the system is fully automated, just like me. <laughs> I'm going to get a U.S. Navy Department of the Boat People hoodie because I love their management style. Now, I will be cooler than any of you lads once I get my drone sweet drone shot. Now, I'm going to get a landmine marker shirt because they blow up just like windows. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to get. Oh, no. It is Steve Wozniak from uh, Apple. That's right, you nerds. You think you're the coolest for wearing a shirt? Well, Ryan McBeth is all the work. Yeah. So go buy a shirt from Bunk branding to fund Ryan Beth to increase your understanding. Oh yeah!